see that? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. Go on, Sanakshi. Hello. Okay. Sorry. We we lost Sanakshi uh, a little bit there. Anshi, what about you? Um, sorry. I think you just switched off your camera, but. Um, what are you looking forward to from, from today's webinar? Okay, so there's this really cool quote by this um, author called Arthur C. Clarke. So he had once said that there are two possibilities, either we're alone in the universe or we're not, and both are equally terrifying. And I think that quote really spoke to me, and that's the exact reason why I wanted to come to this webinar, because everything about space really intrigues me. So I was like, why not? Okay, very cool. I, I must say that it's so amazing to see what you guys are saying. I'm sure Matt is listening right now. And, and you know, it's good, good to know as to how intrigued you really guys are, uh, you know, with the planet, with the stars, with, with the galaxies around us, right? And uh, this is a little hope from our side to sort of give you a little bit, you know, demystifying astronomy for you. Hopefully Matt can talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the ways as a high school student and afterwards things that you can do if you're thinking about astronomy Astronomy moving forward, um, you know, after high school. Hi, Chinmay. Hi, how are you? Very well. Chinmay, what, uh, just tell us again, uh, you know, we're just having a casual conversation. What are you looking forward to learning I think, after today's webinar? And why uh, are you so here? I think, uh, as I think everyone who's here, I think I'm, given, given that I'm a high school student, I'm not, I don't have the opportunity to actually, like, I've not had the opportunity to possibly like do as much research not research but like view planets as such like look at the Hubble telescope and like stuff like that and I've looked at pictures and I've done research and space is something which really really fast fascinates me and just learning about uh things we can which which are billions and billions of light years away and black holes which we we have to travel I don't know how many years it's countless we will have to travel just to access it and the fact that we are able to look at it is something which fascinates me a lot Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And, and at this time, guys, thank you, Chinmay, Anshi, Sanakshi, everyone who did switch on their cameras. I still would really hope that some, some more students do that. Uh, but at this point of time, if you have any particular questions from your side, which you would want Matt to um, sort of cover, um, you know, it'd be great that if there are any questions or anything that you feel um, that you would really like to know about, this will be a good time. And hopefully after Matt gets done with this presentation um, and talk, we can sort of cover those questions as well. Anyone, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and sort of talk through it. Yeah, um, so I guess we're talking about research. So I had a few questions about that. If you're a high school student, what's the best way um, to, you know, do something in space for your, um, you know, either you know your career or college applications because when you're a high school student there are a lot of legal restrictions for you to get into the space field because of you know um, because in some countries it comes under um, you know advanced warfare and all that so like what's the best way to do some space research or something like that okay. that's that's a really good question i think there are there are a couple of interesting ways you could get involved and um, the first one there are these projects that get called citizen science projects and basically the basically the idea is is that uh astronomy involves lots of very like huge data sets right like, so like surveys for galaxies for example have millions and millions and millions of galaxies and there aren't enough astronomers in the world to trawl through all this data and so there are projects these citizen science projects uh one the one i'm thinking of is called galaxy zoo <coughs> where we encourage kind of you know keen members of the public or high schoolers to come along and help us look through this data and so um you know just for free if you want you can come along and you can start uh it will teach you a little bit about how galaxies work for example and then you can start actually looking at this data that no one has seen before and classifying galaxies into different types and like this really really helps professional astronomy research and this is the kind of thing you can just kind of get involved. Like if you have a free afternoon, you can just go to Galaxy Zoo and um, start getting involved. And that will teach you a lot about astrophysics. Um, the second one, this is maybe, maybe less about doing space research, but is definitely good for your career if you care about this field, would be to learn some coding. Um, a lot of being a, a physicist and a lot of being an astrophysicist involves um, computer coding. 
And I, I, did, I didn't learn much computer coding in school at all. I basically had to pick it up, all of it, when I started my research career, when I started my PhD. Um, people that learn computer coding in school um, are at like a massive advantage. And again, when you're applying for university places, um, having kind of taken your own time to learn this kind of thing shows a huge amount of initiative. And the nice thing is that you can learn computer coding just at home for free, right? There are so many um, amazing websites that will teach you stuff. I know this is uh, Khan Academy um, is one of the biggest websites uh, in the world for kind of te learning stuff at home. And um, yeah, there are all, all kinds of resources that you can do. Sorry, my, my, my cat is kind of distracting me. <laughs> Everyone say hi to my cat. <laughs> no problem, Matt. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, well, so yeah. Yes, yes. I think, yeah, those are yeah, so citizen science projects, and I would definitely look into Galaxy Zoo, and then just yeah, like just try and pick up a bit of coding, um, because um, if you go into this field, you're going to be doing an awful lot of it. So um, getting a head start is only a good thing. Sounds good. Aditya, you have a follow up question quickly, and then we'll begin. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so do you know? Uh, so there are pl like a bunch of coding languages. Like, is there any particular data scientists use, and could you suggest? a few of those citizen science projects because I'm not aware of any. Yeah, sure. So I think the citizen science project I'm most familiar with is called Galaxy Zoo. And uh, that's basically, it's a galaxy classification thing. So it's taking these big surveys for galaxies that have millions and millions of images and helping to classify them into different types. And so basically, if when you join Galaxy Zoo, you will get a bit of a crash course in uh, galactic astronomy, and then you will start seeing data and you can, you know, you can make a contribution to research. So yeah, Galaxy Zoo is the one I would look into. Um, in terms of programming like languages, um, it's it's lots of Python these days. Um, I think the, the two the two that would be good to learn are would be Python and C plus um, plus. Python is very very flexible and uh, is generally used for almost everything, and C plus plus is very fast and powerful. Um, so if, if you're going to pick one of these, I would pick Python. Uh, I think that that's absolutely the one to use. Python is very, very wide, very, very widely used um, across all of space science. Uh, you can't go wrong with Python. Okay. Thank you, Aditya. Yeah, he, he's saying thank you for, for all the suggestions, Matt. Okay. So on that note, thank you everyone who's joined us uh, today. I'm just going to quick put a quick spotlight on Matt. Uh, um, you know, with the presentation on, but would love to welcome Dr. Matt Bothwell, who's a public astronomer at the University of Cambridge. Um, I know, would love to know a little bit more about what an observational astronomer really is, but that's what I think, you know, is classified for you, Matt. And uh, of course, he's got a very cool book, which, you know, if you guys, um, you know, would love to study a little bit more, it's coming out in a month um, called The Invisible Universe. Um, so for all of you enthusiasts, I, I will share a lot of the materials that hopefully maybe after today's presentation, Matt can share with me, um, uh, you know, whether that's a little bit of research work that he's just talked about or anything else. But thank you so much, Matt, once again for, for um, you know, joining us today and um, would love to begin, you know, shortly with uh, a little bit of um, introduction about yourself, if you can tell us sort of what your journey was uh, back in England, um, you know, from your high school to now where you are um, as a public astronomer, and then we can begin with the session today. So again, welcome from the from the Big Red Group team. Um, thank you for, uh, you know, being here with us and over to you. Cool. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's really cool to be talking to you. Um, yeah, so just to fill you in a bit about my background, um, I was always really obsessed with science when I was a kid. Um, I think even from a really young age, I knew I wanted to be some kind of scientist. Um, I didn't know what kind of scientist though. I kind of bounced, bounced around. Like when I was really little, I was really crazy about dinosaurs as, as many people are. And then uh, as, as I kind of got older, when I, when I think I was about the age of most people here, I knew my main thing was that I knew I was interested in really big questions. And as far as I could tell, the most interesting big questions at the time was either, you know, on the one hand, kind of astronomy cosmology. So asking questions like, why does the universe exist or what happened with the Big Bang or are there aliens out there? You know, these kind of big astronomy questions. But I was also fascinated by like the human mind and psychology and neuroscience, you know, like how are we conscious, you know, why, how do our brains work, these kind of questions. 
and I had a really hard time deciding which one of these uh, roads to go down. Uh, so I did a bunch of like physics and maths and chemistry and biology in high school. And then I went to university to do psychology and neuroscience to kind of study how our minds work. And then I changed my mind <laughs> in the first year of university. And so I actually dropped out of university uh, in my first year and, uh, you know, worked in a terrible call center job um, and then went back uh, a second time. So I, I basically spoke to my university and they were very kind to let me uh, kind of change my course. And so I went back to do astronomy and I did my undergraduate degree in astronomy and uh, just was crazy about it. I just thought it was the most fun thing ever. Uh, then I got a chance to go and study for, for my master's degree in Harvard in the States. And so I went over to the States to do my master's degree and then came back to the UK to do my PhD in astronomy, which is where I um, kind of developed my special, you know, my special area of research, which is all about looking at baby galaxies forming and understanding how galaxies work. And then uh, I, I traveled across the States again. There's a, if, if you're a scientist or an astronomer, there's, there's a lot of traveling around the world. So I went to live in Arizona for a while. Uh, and then I came back to the UK and um, still being a researcher. But then a few years ago, I realized that uh, I was getting a little bit burned out on science research, but I realized like what I loved more than anything and what I was really passionate about was communicating science. Um, I realized that I liked talking about science to people um, so much and kind of sharing my excitement and sharing uh, all the cool things that are going on in astronomy. Um, so I, I, I left my research position to take up this uh, job of public astronomer uh, for the University of Cambridge. So my job now is basically it's just communicating astronomy in every way. And so um, anything, anything that involves talking about astronomy with people uh, is my job these days, which I, I feel very lucky. I feel like I have, a, <laughs> I feel like I have a perfect job. Um, okay, that, that's a, a the history of my life in four minutes. Um, okay, I guess what, so. What I'm going to do now, so the plan for today is to talk a little bit about this topic, Searching for Earth 2.0. And I, I chose this topic because this is one of the most cutting edge and the most exciting things happening in astronomy at the moment. Um, a lot of the research that we do in Cambridge um, is involved in this. He's looking for planets around other stars and looking for life in the universe. Um, yeah, so it's, it's cutting edge in terms of pushing back our knowledge it's also cutting edge in terms of what we can do with our instruments right so it's um yeah it is cutting edge science by any definition so i wanted to kind of share uh, share some of the work we were doing so the plan is i'm going to kind of talk about this for a little bit for maybe half an hour show you some pictures and then we can maybe transition and just do kind of question and answer you can ask me about this topic or about anything to do with space or uh, whatever you like okay so I think this is a quite a good place to start. Uh, good place to start this talk with a view of the night sky because as astronomy is the oldest science, right? Um, since human beings have existed, we have been doing astronomy. Um, in the early days, what that meant was, you know, kind of walking away from the campfire at night and gazing up and looking at the stars and trying to understand how the universe works and trying to understand our place in the cosmos by looking at the patterns of lights in the sky. Oh, I've got hiccups, I'm sorry. By looking at the patterns of lights in the sky. And fundamentally, that's still what we're doing with, with astronomy. We're looking at the patterns of lights in the sky and we're using what we see to understand the universe. Um, so this view here is a view of the night sky if you go to somewhere nice and dark. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Wait, are you, are you are you guys all based in Delhi, or uh, I don't know if you're kind of scattered around all kinds of places? Yeah, I, I think from all around the country. But yeah, if okay. So Sunday. some of you, I'm so I'm guessing you don't get nice guys like this in Delhi. But I think if you we we, we don't get nice guys like this in Cambridge, and I think I think Delhi is a little bit bigger than Cambridge. Um, but uh, and any of you that are kind of lucky enough to maybe live out outside cities in more rural areas. Um, or if you've ever traveled there, you can see night skies like this. And so if you go to somewhere really dark, you can see uh, kind of uh, roughly um, about 3000 stars, more or less in the night sky. And of course, this thing here, the Milky Way galaxy, which I'm not going to talk about much today, but it's pretty impressive when you can see it. And um, the thing I want to focus on is really the stars. So at least, uh, at least in Western astronomy, it was the ancient Greeks who first realized that broadly there are two different types of stars 
Um, most of the 3000 stars that we saw in the night sky are what people call the fixed stars. So these are the stars that stayed in the same place night after night. And of course, they don't quite stay in the same place, right? Because our planet is spinning around. So things rise in the east and set in the west and travel around the sky. But the, the patterns and the positions of the stars in this spinning sky were the same. So if you found a constellation, you could come back kind of night after night after night, and that constellation would look the same. And so of the thousands and thousands of stars, most of them are these fixed stars. But there were a handful of stars that seemed to move around against the background of these fixed stars. And by a handful, I mean there were literally five. There were these five stars that seemed very bright and they would move. So astronomers would come back night after night after night and these bright stars would move around against the background. So these, uh, these ancient Greeks had no idea what these were, right? Uh, but they knew they were special because there were only five of these moving things. So they called them the wandering stars, the wanderers. Uh, Although they, they didn't they didn't actually say wanderer, right? Because that's an English word. So they use the Greek word for wanderer, which is planet. And so they called these wandering stars the planets. And so that's even that's before we understood our solar system, before we understood our place in the universe. We saw these things in the sky, we called them planets, and we knew that they were special. Um, if we jump forward about a thousand years, we reach a view of the universe that looks like this. So this is an old fashioned way of drawing the universe where we have the Earth in the center and then orbiting around the Earth. We have it's quite hard to read it's in kind of old fashioned script, but you can see the moon, Venus, Mercury, the sun, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn all orbiting around the Earth. Um, this is wrong, right? I mean, so they made a pretty big mistake, which is that they put the Earth in the middle rather than the sun in the middle. Um, it's a pretty human thing to kind of imagine that we are at the center of the universe. Um, so, you know, people have been doing that forever. Um, so th this is like an old fashioned view of the universe where we thought everything was circling around us. If we jump forward another thousand years now, we can reach the modern view of our solar system. So this is the solar system that I'm sure you, everyone uh, knows and remembers and loves from school. Uh, we have a solar system where we have the sun, which is a star, and then orbiting the sun are these eight smaller planets. And so the sun contains almost all of the mass in our solar system, and it sits there in the middle of the solar system, and the planets orbit around it, right? <clears throat> and so our understanding of planets and solar systems and stars has mainly come from looking at our solar system, right? We've been studying it for hundreds of years. And then so all of these features of the solar system have told us about how stars and planets work. So what do we learn about our solar system? Like when scientists look at our solar system, what clues are there that teach us about how planets are made and how stars are made? Well, there are all kinds of things, uh, but just pulling out a few at random, it's very notable that the orbits of the planets are all in a plane, uh, right? So planets aren't just kind of whizzing around the sun at random. Planets are kind of confined to this imaginary flat surface orbiting around the star. That's got to tell you something, right? That's probably not a, not a coincidence. So whatever the physics uh, that makes the solar systems, you obviously have to end up with all the planets orbiting around in this same plane. There's also this uh, division, which I'm guessing you all learn in school, where all the planets close to the sun are these small rocky things, and then all the planets far away from the sun are these big gas planets, right? So Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are small and rocky. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are big gas giants. And again, that's got to tell you something, right? That's telling you that, you know, whatever the physics is that makes solar systems, you obviously have to end up with little rocky planets close to the star and big gas giant planets far away from the star. And so these features, along with all kinds of other features, um, have led to our theory of how solar systems get made. The problem is, though, we're doing something very dangerous in science, which is building a huge amount of theory on what is basically just one observation. Like at the end of the day, we just live in one solar system, right? So if we are, if our solar system is a bit weird in any way, we could be completely wrong about uh, the way solar systems work. And so what we want to do 
is solve a really, really ancient question, which is look for planets around other stars and study other solar systems. And again, this, this is one of the oldest questions that humanity has ever been asking, right? If you go back again to those ancient Greeks I mentioned at the start, they were asking questions like, are there other worlds with other beings living on them, right? Um, they didn't quite call them planets because they didn't really know what planets were. I mean, they didn't even know that we were living on a planet, right? But they would ask, they were asking the same like flavor of question. Like, are there other worlds? Are there other creatures living in these other worlds? And this is still a question that we're trying to get out today. Once we realized that our sun was just a regular star, just like every other star in the sky, it stood to reason that all of the stars in the sky might very well have planets around them. And so the question became, how do we go and look for these planets in other solar systems? So your, your first idea might be just to build a really, really big telescope and stare really hard because that's that's like what astronomers love to do more than anything, right? We build big telescopes and we stare at things. The problem is this is a terrible way to look for planets. This doesn't work. And the reason is the really obvious thing that stars are really, really big and bright and planets are really, really small and faint. And trying to find a small faint thing next to a big bright thing is very, very hard. Um, as an analogy, it's a bit like kind of walking down the streets and uh, looking, trying to stare really, really hard at uh, like a lighthouse, trying to find a little firefly or something buzzing around the lighthouse. It doesn't really matter, you know, how powerful your binoculars are or how closely you stare. You're never going to see the firefly, right, because the lighthouse is going to blind you. So we need to be a bit more clever. We can't just stare really hard with a big telescope. We need to be a bit more smart about the way we do this. And so these are the two ways that astronomers go about looking for planets around other stars. Um, depending on how scientific we want to be, you can either call them the wobble method or the shadow method, or if you want to be a bit more scientific, we can call them the Doppler shift method and the transit method. And so these are the techniques that astronomers actually use to hunt for these planets around other stars. The nice thing is that even though this is very cutting edge science, there's nothing actually complicated going on. Like the way these work is based on very, very, very simple physics. So what I want to do is just first of all, just kind of explain how each of these works in turn. So you get an idea of how astronomers actually look for other worlds, and then we'll go and move on and talk about the things we find. So first of all, this wobbling method, this shadow, uh, this kind of Doppler shift method for finding planets. The only thing you really have to think about uh, for this uh, wobble method is gravity. So let's think about the Earth and the Sun. Um, the Sun uh, kind of pulls on the Earth with this gravitational force, right, which is why the Earth orbits around the Sun. And because the sun is a million times more massive than the earth, the gravitational pull is much, much stronger, right? And so this, uh, this is why the, this fact that we learn in school that the sun sits there in the middle of the, of the solar system and the earth orbits around it because of the gravity of the sun, right? Easy. The problem is, is that this isn't really true because the earth has a gravitational pull as well. Like we're all feeling it right now, right? The reason we're not floating off to the ceiling is because we're feeling the earth's gravitational pull. And so just as the sun will pull on the earth, the earth will also pull on the sun. And the sun weighs a million times more than the earth, so it's a lot harder to move, but it will pull. And so this thing that uh, maybe you learn in school that the sun sits there not moving and the earth orbits around it is not quite true. What happens is that the earth orbits around the sun and in turn, the sun kind of wobbles around it wobbles backwards and forwards as it's pulled around by the gravity of the Earth. And this wobbling is something we can see. So the planets themselves are invisible, but stars are easily easy to see. And so if we point our telescope at a star and we see this star kind of wobbling around, this tells us that the star is being pulled around by the gravity of an invisible planet. This is a kind of a cartoon of the way it works, right? So you have the planet going in this big wide orbit around a star, then in turn, the star is kind of pulled around just a little bit by the gravity of the planet. If you want to be very scientific, what's actually happening is that both the Earth and the Sun are orbiting their common center of mass. 
um, uh, a bit like if you want to kind of balance a seesaw, you have to put the balance point at the center of mass. But the sun is so much bigger, the center of mass of the Earth Sun system is actually inside the sun. And so the sun really just kind of wobbles around a bit in this kind of wobbly dance. So this is actually how we found the first ever exoplanet orbiting a different star. Um, so this word exoplanet just means a planet that's not in our solar system. And it, we found it orbiting the star 51 Pegasus. So um, and remember, as always, we're not seeing the planet. All we're seeing is the star. So astronomers pointed their telescopes at this star, 51 Pegasus, and they saw this star wobbling. And so what this graph, uh, what you're looking at here, the up and down axis the on the left is the speed of the star and the the side to side axis on the bottom is the time so and all these red dots are different measurements of the speed of this star and so what you can see is this star's speed changing it kind of goes faster then slower then faster then slower in this kind of wobbling motion right this kind of like a, this is away from us then towards us then away from us then towards us this star is wobbling around which means it has to be being pulled around by an invisible planet and this is the first time that anyone had ever seen this. Uh, so this, uh, these two people that discovered this, you can see in the corner is uh, two people called Michael Mayer and Didier Queloz. They won the Nobel Prize in physics for this a couple of years ago. So this right here that you're looking at is a Nobel Prize winning graph. This is the first ever planet we found. So the star is called 51 Pegasus. So Astronomers being pretty terrible at naming things called the planet 51 Pegasus B. Um, and so this is a famous planet, 51 Pegasus B, the first ever exoplanet we found orbiting a different star. Um, so what, what's this planet like? Well, it's a gas giant. It's roughly the same size as Saturn, right? So it's about half of Jupiter. And the interesting thing is that it's orbiting its parent star so fast, one year on this planet, one lap around the star takes four days. So a year on this planet is four days long. And in order to orbit that quickly, it has to be very close. So this is a cartoon of our inner solar system with Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. This is where 51 Pegasus B is uh, on this same distance scale. And so you can kind of immediately see this turns the astronomy world upside down and it turns it made everyone very excited for two reasons first of all it was the first ever exoplanet we found orbiting a star, you know a different star which is already one of the most important scientific discoveries of all time but secondly remember this thing i said earlier on that one of the really foundational things about our solar system was that you have you know, small rocky planets close to the star and big gas giant planets further away and that basically told all astronomers how planet systems form the first planet that we found outside of our solar system is this gas giant planet that is closer than anything we have um so this one discovery this one discovery basically told us that we were completely wrong about how we thought planets uh, worked, which is kind of amazing. You don't often get just one discovery that that turns your whole world upside down. Uh, but this was it. So yeah, 51 Pegasus B, very, very famous and important planet. So this was found in 1995, uh, which is, what is it now? Kind of 35, uh, 35 years, no, no, about 25 years ago. Is that right? What is time anymore? Who knows? <laughs> um yeah so that, that was found around, around around kind of 25 so coming up coming up to 30 years ago um so and the last 30 years have have really been uh, an amazing time for planets science which we'll get onto in a bit so the second way we look for planets is what, what i'm going to call the shadow method or the transit method and to understand this we can look at this film from our solar system so the big bright thing uh, in the background is the sun, of course, and the little shadow going across the face is the planet Venus. Now, what you're going to notice is that you can't actually see Venus directly, right? Um, all you're seeing is a shadow, or more accurately, the silhouette caused by Venus passing in front of the face of the sun. Right, you're seeing Venus blocking some of the light from the sun. Um, if you think about it, it's, it's a bit like a solar eclipse. If you think about a solar eclipse, 
what a solar eclipse is, is when the moon passes in front of the sun and blocks all of the light from the sun. Right. So a solar eclipse is when a, when all of the sun's light gets blocked by the moon and it goes dark in the middle of the day. This is like a little mini version of an eclipse where Venus doesn't block all the light from the sun. It just blocks a tiny amount of the sun. But that would be detectable if you could take a telescope and measure how much light was coming from the sun. As Venus passes in front, you'd notice some of the light being blocked, like the sun would get just a little bit less bright. And that's something that we could discover. And so that works for other stars as well. So if another star has planets orbiting around it, going across the face, then all we have to do to discover that there's a planet there is measure the brightness of this star. And when a planet passes in front of the face of the star, we like the star would get a little bit less bright. And so we can't actually see the planet going in front, right? Because stars are too far away, but we can measure the brightness of stars very easily. And so if we're measuring the brightness of the star and the brightness kind of dips like this, this tells us again that there is a planet orbiting that star and it's just blocking a little bit of the light as it goes past. Um, the difficult thing about this is that these dips in brightness are really, really small. So even a big planet, like the planet Jupiter, is only going to block about 1% of the brightness of the sun. So, you know, if you were an alien seeing the solar system from the outside, when Jupiter passes in front of the sun, you'd see the sun go from 100% brightness down to 99% brightness. And that's for a big planet. Um, the amount of light that gets blocked is going to depend on the size of the planet. So if you imagine Earth instead of Jupiter, it's going to block a really, really tiny amount of the light. So if you were an alien looking at our solar system from the outside, you'd see Earth blocking about 0.01% of the light from the sun. That's one part in 10,000. It's an incredibly tiny amount of light being blocked. Um, so this is what one actually looks like. So this is some real data now. So this is what a real transiting exoplanet looks like. So again, remember, we're not, we're not seeing the planet. We're never seeing the planet. We're seeing the light from the star. And so this is time on the bottom. And then this on uh, this here is brightness. And so this top line here marked one is the star at 100% brightness. And then you're seeing here the star at 100% brightness and then dipping down. And then this dip is when the planet goes in front and blocks a bit of the star. And then when, it, when the planet passes along, it goes back to 100% brightness. So this is what an exoplanet transit looks like. So if you, if you see a star kind of getting a little bit less bright in this pattern, you know you have an exoplanet. And you can even work out how big the planet is because the amount of light that gets blocked tells you the size. Like I so said, the more light being blocked, the bigger the planet. And so that's how we knew that uh, that's, you know, that for say 51 Pegasus B, for example, is a gas giant planet, because as well as wobbling, it also transits in front. And so we could measure how much light is being blocked. And that tells us how big the planet is. The problem with this method, of course, is that they're really rare. So we, I showed you that video of Venus transiting the sun. Venus only transits the sun in our solar system because there's a nice straight line, right? The sun and Venus and us here on Earth make a nice straight line so we can see it going in front. If we were, you know, looking at our solar system from above, we wouldn't see the planet passing in front of the star. So you have to be very exactly lined up uh, to be able to see this. Um, it turns out that the odds are about 200 to 1 more or less, of seeing a planet transiting. So if there were 200 random aliens staring at our solar system, one of them would be able to see uh, the Earth transiting. And if you flip that problem around, from our point of view here on Earth, if we want to find one planet, we have to look at 200 stars and wait for these little dips in brightness. Uh, which is pretty boring and pretty tedious. Uh, luckily, astronomers don't mind doing uh, this kind of long, tedious work. It's what we have computers for. So astronomers built this telescope called Kepler and put it into space. And Kepler's whole job was to search for planets around other stars using this method. So Kepler's job was to stare at hundreds of thousands of stars and wait for these tiny little dips in brightness that tell you there is a planet transiting in front. Um, I'm gonna show you all the things that Kepler found. Bear in mind, first of all, that 
before Kepler came along, finding planets was hard. We would find maybe one or two planets a year. These things, it was very, very difficult to do. These are all, whoops, these are all the planets that Kepler found. So this is a cartoon that the team put together of all the planets discovered by Kepler. Uh, the, the colors mean something like red means hot and blue means kind of colder and the sizes mean something. So, you know, the big blobs mean big planets and so on. So every single colored dot you can see here is a real exoplanet discovered by Kepler. So we went way past the point where we were just finding one or two or a handful of planets here and there. We, we know loads of these things. Kepler on its own found about 1,200 planets orbiting other stars. And in total now, we know of nearly 5,000 planets in other star systems. And ne nearly 5,000, that's incredible. When I was at school, we knew about like one. And now we know of 5,000 exoplanets. It's completely extraordinary. Um, some of these things are incredible. One of Kepler's biggest discoveries was lots of planets orbiting double stars. Um, we are, our sun is quite unusual being a star on its own. Most stars in the universe are what we call binary stars with two stars orbiting around them. Uh, before Kepler, we didn't know if you could have planets orbiting binary stars. Um, and it turns out that yes, we have found planets orbiting twin sun stars. Um, this used to be something from science fiction, right? I don't know how many of you have seen Star Wars. Um, Star Wars, you know, this film from the 1970s, the main character is from a planet where there's two suns in the sky. That used to be just pure imagination. Now we know there are planets you could stand on where there would be two suns in the sky. It's incredible. Um, transits can also reveal some very strange and interesting things. So I'm going to show you one of the weirdest things that Kepler found now. It's a, it's a star called J1407. So remember, as always, we're not seeing the planet, we're only seeing the star. What this is, so this is our, this is the light curve of this star J1407 uh, over about six months, right? So the telescope looked at this star between February and July, and these are all the different measurements of the star's brightness. Now, this looks really weird. Remember this thing I showed you before, this is what a, a normal transit looks like, right? It's very nice and neat and symmetrical because you have a the star, which is a sphere, and you have a planet, which, which is a sphere. Then you have the planet passing in front of the star. It should be very nice and neat and well behaved. This, on the other hand, looks crazy, right? So the shape is really wrong. The star also seems to be kind of flickering on and off. It gets kind of dimmer and then brighter and then dimmer and then brighter in a way that shouldn't really make sense. But the other crazy thing about this as well, um, sorry, question, uh, does 51 Pegasus B revolve around binary stars? No, 51 Pegasus B um, is a single star. Good question. Um, the other really crazy thing about this as well, you remember saying, be saying even a big planet, something like Jupiter, is only going to block about 1% of the star's light. There, the, whatever is passing in front of this star here is blocking 100% of the star's light, right? So this is 100%, this is 50% in the middle, this is 0% right at the bottom. This thing is blocking 100% of the star's light, which is kind of crazy. I mean, how can a planet block out in a whole star? It would have to be as big as a star, and those don't exist. You can't have planets the size of a star. So this confused astronomers for a very long time. It turns out the only thing that could be causing this is a planet with a ring system 200 times the size of Saturn's rings. And so that explains everything. These, these huge rings explain how the, uh, the light from the star was being blocked. And that kind of weird flickering on and off is explained by the gaps in the rings. And so it actually turns out that what was previously this really confusing kind of messy flickering that was confusing was actually a beautifully accurate map of this planet's ring system. And so you can even patch it up. So we can take every kind of flicker in the data and turn that into a map of the rings. And so every time the star kind of gets a bit dimmer, it means it's, beh it's passing behind a little ring. Every time the star gets brighter again, it means it's peeking out from between a ring gap. And so this kind of crazy complex flickering was actually a map of this planet's rings. Um, we, we wanted to map Saturn's rings in our own solar system for years and years. And eventually we had to actually go there 
uh, with a spacecraft called Cassini to map Saturn's rings. Um, now we can map this, this planet's rings about 20 light years away using this technique. It's completely amazing. Um, this planet's rings are so big, by the way, that if we could, if, if we took our own solar system and replaced Saturn with this planet, this is what our daytime sky would look like. Um, so this is what our sky would look like. It, it would dominate even the daytime. And I can't even imagine what it would look like at night. This is the moon for comparison on the left hand side. Um, so, yeah, there are some pretty amazing things that we uh, out there in space that we don't have in our solar system. Um, OK, well, I want to quickly tell you what the future of this field is, because you would have noticed every, I, I keep saying we're not seeing the planet. We're only seeing the star, which kind of sucks. Right. Um, if you want to do science with something, you want to be able to observe it directly. And if we're only ever seeing the star, we're kind of limited into how much we can actually learn about these planets. Oh, sorry. A uh, question um, from Banshika uh, said, uh, can the transit method help to find the orbiting period of the, of the body? You are exactly right. The transit method does help you find because we, in order to be strict, we don't just want one transit. In order to say for sure that there is a planet, we want at least two transits and ideally three. And that's if you see three transits, that tells you you'll you can find the orbital period. And that is really, really useful because if you know how long it takes for the planet to orbit around the star, that tells you how far it is away from the star, um, which, you know, which tells you how hot the, the, how hot it is on the planet. It tells you all kinds of interesting things. And in fact, if you just see one transit, you know, how do you know if it's really a planet or how do you know it might just be a piece of kind of space junk or something that's kind of floated between you? So in order to be really sure it's a planet, you want to fight. We really want kind of multiple transits. Um, where we can see things going round and round and round. Okay, the future um, is we want to see the planets directly, but to do that, we have to solve that problem I spoke about right at the start. Remember that whole uh, kind of lighthouse versus firefly thing where the planet is really, really small and dim and the star is really, really big and bright. What we want to do is block the light from the star, and this is the idea. So we have a plan to send a telescope up into space with this thing called the starshade. And what the starshade is, it's about the size of a football pitch. And the idea is, it is the perfect shape. This sunflower shape is the perfect shape for blocking light from stars. And so these two things will launch into space together and then fly apart until they're maybe a million miles apart. And then the starshade will very carefully position itself over a star and that will let us see the planets for real. So it's a bit like kind of holding up your finger and kind of blocking out the light from the star. The idea is that this will let you see the planets for real. Uh, we know this will work because we built a little toy version of it. Um, so this is the first ever direct detection of exoplanets in a distant solar system. And so just to explain what you're looking at, uh, so the, the, this was taken with a, a little kind of small toy version of this, uh, this mission I, I talk, spoke about. We're looking at a solar system like from above, and there is a star in the middle that we have very carefully blocked out the light of. And these blobs orbiting around it are planets. So this, this is crazy to me. This always just absolutely blows my mind that we're seeing this. We are literally seeing another solar system kind of orbiting around in front of our eyes. We're looking at another solar system. Um, it's completely amazing. Uh, a quick question, question was, if you block out the light, how can you see the planets? Because uh, you only see the planet due to the reflection of light. That is absolutely right. So planets don't make their own light. Um, at least if we're looking at the light, we can see with their eyes at least. So what we do, we, we block out the light from the sun and we still see the reflection. So it's a bit like if you were in a room uh, with, a, you know, with one really bright light bulb that was just you know, dazzling you, you could kind of hold your hand up and block the light from the light bulb. You would still be able to see the rest of the room in reflected light, but you'd just be kind of stopping yourself being dazzled by the bright light bulb. That's basically the thing. We block the light from the sun uh, by kind of just putting an object in front of it, and then we can see the reflected light from the other planets. So this the, that is the future. So we're hoping that's going to launch in about 10 years' time, maybe. That's definitely the future of the field. The reason we want to study these planets more and more carefully is because we want to answer this very, very big question. Is there life elsewhere in the universe? 
there's only so much we can do with these indirect detection methods. You know, if we're seeing stars being wobbled around or if we're seeing the light from stars being blocked, we can tell there's a planet there. We can't really learn much about it. What we really want to do is to learn about the planets themselves and study their atmospheres. To do that, we are going to have to study the planets uh, directly by seeing them. And um, so which planets are good for life is a really important question. If we're going to answer this question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? We have to, first of all, understand which planets are suitable for life. Because remember this planet I spoke about, first of all, this 51 Pegasus B. This is a terrible place for life, right? Um, it's uh, First of all, it's a gas giant planet, so there's no surface to walk on. Um, it's also so close to its parent star. Rem remember I said it orbits in just four days. It's so close to its parent star, the temperature on this planet is thousands and thousands of degrees. So this whole planet is basically a big burning cloud in space, right? Terrible place, uh, terrible place to look for life. So what we are in interested in is not just any planet, but a planet that is suitable for light. Uh, for life, sorry, a planet that's suitable for life. And the way we define that is through temperature. So think about our inner solar system, right? So the Sun and Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Mercury and Venus are almost certainly too hot for life, right? Venus is hot enough to melt lead. So the general rule is if you're too close to your parent star, it's too hot for life and the chemistry of life can't get going. But if you're too far away from your star, you have the opposite problem. Um, that on Mars, the, temp the winter temperature gets down to about minus 150, which is probably too cold for the, the chemistry of life to work. And so we have this general, general rule that if you're too hot, to, uh, too, too close to your star, it's too hot. If you're too far away from your star, it's too cold. Where you want to be is this in-between zone where the temperature is just right for life. And this gets called the habitable zone and habitable meaning you can live in it or sometimes the Goldilocks zone um, after the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. Do you, do you guys know about the, the Goldilocks story? Yeah. You've heard of it. Okay. The, the, the reason I'm asking, I, I, I gave this talk to a group of students from a Chinese university a couple of weeks ago, and none of them had ever heard of this. So I, as soon as I said, and we called this the Goldilocks zone, and they all said, what? <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so, yeah, because it's not too hot, it's not too cold, the temperature is just right. So what astronomers really care about is the Goldilocks zone. So planets in this, uh, in this region where the temperature is just right for life. And of course, every single star will have a Goldilocks zone, right? Um, it's not just our solar system. So hot stars will have a Goldilocks zone that's very far away. Uh, cold stars will have a Goldilocks zone that's very close in. You have to kind of huddle around for warmth. But every star will have a Goldilocks zone. And so when astronomers look for planets, the question is, is there a planet in this Goldilocks zone? And if there is, we get very excited uh, and say, okay, so everyone in the chat is saying they know Goldilocks, wonderful. <laughs> um, if there is, then we get very excited and we say, okay, we found a planet that's suitable for life. The problem is that these things are very, very hard to find. And so we don't really know of uh, many habitable planets at all. Um, that's not because they're rare. Habitable planets might be very, very common. It's because they're hard to find. So almost all of the planets that we've discovered so far are like 51 Pegasus B. They are big gas giant planets very, very close to their star. And that's because the methods that we use to find planets are what we call biased. So, uh, and by biased, I mean, these methods are going to tend to find big planets close to their stars. So think about this kind of wobble method, first of all, you know, this ground of gravitational wobble method. A very big planet, very close to your star, is going to tend to find, uh, you know, it will, it will cause a bigger wobble. And so if you're just looking for wobbles, you're going to find, you know, most easily the big planets close to their stars that are causing these big gravitational wobbles. A big planet very close to the star is also going to block out the most light. And so if you're just looking for transits, you're going to find most easily the really big things close to the star. And so 
all the methods that we have seem to be designed for finding big, big planets close to their stars, which is why we find so many of them. So small habitable planets are maybe not rare, but they are at the moment hard to find. So in total, we know of 21 of them. So this is our current list of what we call potentially habitable exoplanets. So these are all the planets in our galaxy, apart from our solar system, that we think life might be possible on. Um, it's, it's a big step down, right? We go from nearly 5,000 in total to 21 that we know about. But even 21 is a really good start. If I was giving this talk five years ago, I would have had to have ended by saying, you know, and we've never found one. Hopefully we will one day. All of these have been found in the last few years and the future is looking even more exciting. So the Kepler Space Telescope I spoke about before uh, ended its mission uh, about five or 10 years ago. So we're not finding many more exoplanets at the moment. But Kepler's replacement is going to be a telescope called Plato, and Plato is going to launch in maybe kind of three, four, five years time. Plato's whole job is going to be finding Earth-like exoplanets. And so we'd like, you know, Kepler 2.0 is going to be searching for Earth 2.0. And so that's actually, it's actually really wonderful for people your age as well. So if you guys are thinking about careers in science, um, you know, it means that during your, it means you leave high school, you go to university, and then just as you leave university and start your research careers, that's going to be when Plato is sending back information about Earth-like planets. So it means that you guys starting your research careers is going to be exactly the point that we are discovering hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Earth-like planets and doing things like studying their atmospheres, looking for oxygen and water and signs of life and all this really, really interesting stuff. So the future is really, really bright for exoplanet science. Um, we've come an amazing way just in the last kind of 20 or 30 years. We have come so far. We've, we, you know, we've gone from not knowing if there's any exoplanets out there to finding thousands of them, to finding small Earth-like planets with oxygen and water, and then in the future, hopefully finding hundreds of Earth-like planets suitable for life. And so, yeah, Pete, I'm, I'm very jealous of people your, your age going into your research careers because it means that all of this really exciting science is going to be happening just at, just at the, just at the beginning. So. You never know, someone your age uh, it might be kind of poised to make the next big discovery about life in the universe because I think you're very perfectly timed for it. Okay, I think I've been talking for a long time. That's probably quite a good place to finish. I'll tell you what, um, how I, I think we have about 10 minutes left of our hour. So um, I'm happy to kind of take some questions uh, and happy to just kind of take a space question. So you can ask me questions about, uh, about what I've been talking about today, about planets or just anything in astronomy. Um, we can just have this as a bit of a, Kind of open-ended chat. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt, for that. I mean, I, I didn't want it to stop. Um, you sort of explained all the concepts so nicely with Lucid, <laughs> with, uh, just perfect. And it was really, really inspiring. So um, guys, this is your chance to, again, ask questions, um, see what, what you're planning to do. And, and yeah, we're open for Q&A. So just feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions about the presentation or anything else on astronomy that you wish to. Okay, questions coming through the chat. Um, uh, someone asked a question, uh, Vanshika asks, uh, I, I, think, I think maybe that was before I made my last point. Uh, she says, of all the exoplanets discovered are, are gas giants which are too near to the parent star. Um, most of them, but not all of them. We have these 21 uh, habitable Earth-like planets. We also have more gas giants far away from the star. So most of them are because of our biased methods, uh, but not all. And we're going to be finding more Earth-like planets in the future. Uh, Vismaya says, what exactly is the difference between astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology? Okay. Really, really good questions. Um, so first of all, co cosmology is the easy one to answer there. So cosmology is the study of the entire universe. So asking like, you know, kind of what is a star made of or what is a planet made of or how do galaxies work? That is an astronomy astrophysics question. Cosmology is asking questions about the entire universe. So like how big is the universe? How old is the universe? They're cosmology questions, right? So it's cosmology is the study of the whole universe. Astronomy and astrophysics are the study of the, all the things inside the universe. 
So that's the easy one. Astronomy and astrophysics these days are basically the same thing. Um, they have different names mainly because of historical reasons. Um, if you went back in time 100 years or, or like 150 years, there were different things. Astronomy 150 years ago was getting a telescope and looking at things in the night sky and kind of writing down and making pictures of what you saw. That was astronomy, just kind of looking at the night sky. And astrophysics was, uh, you know, was a branch of physics. It was doing things like maybe trying to work out how the sun burns, right? So kind of using what we know about heat and burning and kind of those physics to understand the universe. And historically, there were two different things, right? So one person would kind of, you know, maybe try to use what we understood about heat and burning to understand the sun. And he would be an astrophysicist. Another person would use a telescope in their back garden to stare at the scars and, and they would be an astronomer. These days, those two things are the same. Um, you know, we we are, if you are a professional astronomer, you use your telescope to look at things and then you go and do physics with it. Um, I think the main difference is that astronomy sounds like kind of fun and ast astrophysics makes you sound really smart. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, so the, the old joke is if you're if you're on a plane and someone asks what you do, if you say you're an astronomer, um, then people will ask you loads of questions. If you say you're an astrophysicist, they'll go, oh, you must be really smart. And then they won't ask you any questions. So if you want a peaceful flight, you say you're an astrophysicist. Um, if you want to ask people's questions, so I, I normally say I'm an astronomer because it just kind of sounds more fun. Um, um, Nivriti says, uh, by wh when do you think we'll have faster means to travel across space? That I would love to know the answer to this. Um, there's someone I, I've forgotten who said this. It might have might have been Oscar Wilde. Some writer says um, prediction is very difficult, especially predicting about, like things about the future. <laughs> um, when we're going to have faster ways to travel across space, who knows? It's a very long way in the future. Right now, all the physics that we know tells us that you can't travel faster than the speed of light, and the speed of light is actually pretty slow. Um, traveling at the speed of light, it would take years to even reach the nearest star and to get outside of our galaxy would take millions of years. So even if we travel at the speed of light, you know, it would be a journey of like 10 years or, or 20 years to reach a habitable planet. So if we're going to kind of reach other planets on a time scale, that actually makes sense to humans and not have to spend 20 years making the journey. We're going to have to travel faster than the speed of light and everything in the laws of physics tells us that's impossible. We can't do it. So the answer might be that it's never possible and space is just too big and we can't really travel around. Um, I hope that's not true because that would be kind of sad, um, but it, we would need to kind of go way beyond the laws of physics as we know them. So who, who even knows? Um, it's kind of like, it, it'd, be, it'd be like asking someone 2000 years ago how to invent a computer, right? They just have, it's so far beyond, they just couldn't give you an answer. Um, okay, uh, Nimish says, you said earlier about that we found out about uh, solar systems being, you know, the small rocky things close to the star and the big gas giants farther away from the star uh, turned out to be wrong. Is it possible that the idea of the Goldilocks zone might be proven wrong in the future? So that's a really interesting question. So the, the science behind the Goldilocks zone, in, at least in terms of telling the temperature, is very easy, right? So we know we can look at the temperature of a star very easily. We know how kind of heat moves through space. So we know exactly how far away from the star is a comfortable temperature for life as we know it. Where it might be proven wrong is that life as we know it bit. Because um, when we think of habitable planets, what we're always thinking of is life on Earth. You know, like what are the conditions that life on Earth likes? It could well be um, that, uh, you know, life on other planets likes these hot temperatures. You know, like I spoke about that 51 Pegasus B where the temperature is thousands of degrees. Maybe there are some cra crazy aliens on those, those planets that like living in thousand degree temperatures. The problem is that we uh, we don't even know where to start looking, right? It's such a big universe. We 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 would at least recognize life as we know it, right? It's like if we look at a planet and we find oxygen and water and carbon dioxide and all of these things, we can say, hey, that looks like a pretty nice planet for life as we know it. If we look at a planet and we see it's burning at thousands of degrees and it's full of sort of sulfur, that might be nice for some crazy aliens, but we just have no idea. 
So just to, to make life easier for ourselves, we just look for life as we know it. Um, so we're not making some like philosophical points that this is all life can be. It's just like a practical thing that it's a very big universe and we have to start somewhere. Um, there are so many questions. I'm definitely not going get to get to them all. I'm sorry. Um, um, Son actually says, uh, how is the James Webb Space Telescope different from Hubble that's going to be launching on December the 18th? So uh, for those of you that are following astronomy, the, the James Webb Space Telescope launching in a couple of months is the most exciting thing happening uh, for a very long time. So the Hubble Space Telescope has been the number one space telescope in the world for about 30 years now. The James Webb Space Telescope launching in about two months time is going to replace Hubble. It's like Hubble 2. Um, the differences are it's much, much bigger, so it can collect way more light and see fainter things. And um, the other big difference is that James Webb Space Telescope is going to be looking in infrared. So Hubble looks at the universe using the light we see with our eyes. James Webb uses infrared light, which means James Webb can see things that Hubble can't. So things that are maybe hidden behind clouds of dust that are invisible to Hubble, James Webb will be able to see really, really clearly. So James Webb can see fainter things and it can even see things that are hidden from Hubble. And so some of James Webb's missions are to look, first of all, relevant to the topic of this talk. And um, one of James Webb's missions is to look for the look at the atmospheres of exoplanets and look for signs of life. That could never happen with Hubble. Hubble is just not good enough. So James Webb is going to be looking for aliens better than ever before. James Webb's uh, also relevant to my area of research. James Webb is uh, has the job of looking at the first stars in the universe. So James Webb is going to try and discover the first stars that switched on after the Big Bang, which is something that we've never seen before. So all kinds of really, really amazing things. Um, it's going to be very exciting. And I really hope it's going up in a rocket. I really hope it doesn't blow up. That'd be very sad. <laughs> Um, uh, Nikita says, um, I saw the exoplanet catalog and there's a planet that's being described as unusually pink. How do we find out that it's pink? Um, that's a really good question. So when, uh, so it's kind of using this very, very new technique I, I told, talked about where we block the light from the star and look at the planet. We've only just started to do that in a kind of very like simple way, but we can look at some of the light that reflects off the planet. And we we were able to tell that its color was pink, so it was this. Oh, is someone on mute? Someone needs to be on mute. I think. Yeah, did that. I, okay, I, cool. I, I figured it out. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sorry. Um. So yes, it's all about the ref looking at the light that reflects off it. Um. But until we have this kind of star shade mission that I showed you the video of, all of this is going to be a bit rough and a bit difficult. When the star shade mission launches, we'll be able to really look at these planets for real. Uh, someone asked about uh, that's a really interesting question about uh, about the field and pe people with kind of disabilities getting into the field. This is a really, really good question because um, there, there are lots of astronomers with different disabilities that work in the field and they they really don't have to be like an, in, an impediment uh, to, to working. Uh, so one example, for example, uh, is that astronomers with kind of low vision and blindness work in the field all the time. And there are ways of taking astronomy data from telescopes and making it accessible for people with low vision and blindness. Uh, so like that might mean turning it into sound or turning it into like a 3D model that you could touch. Um, people, and in terms of things like having trouble reading, like dyslexia, um, that is really not uncommon. Um, Einstein was dy dyslexic, um, probably the most famous scientist of all time, right? Had dyslexia. I, I work in Cambridge with people with dyslexia. Um, so yeah, had, ha having things like kind of like and any kind of like disabilities and trouble reading, all stuff like that re really is no barrier to working in the field. Like we really are open to anyone. I think the most, the most important thing is just being curious about the universe. Um, if you are curious about the universe and you want to and you kind of want to learn about uh, our cosmos um, then yeah there should be absolutely nothing stopping you um how strict are we with, we've gone past 130 how are we doing for time well, well uh, up to you Matt um I would say let's let's keep it for like two three to four more minutes uh, depending on your availability of course and then we'll we'll close it in about five to six minutes that's it that sounds good yeah i'll ask a more questions um um so so, so actually says i, I I'm, I'm doing my best to, um, to pronounce if, if i'm messing up your names please you're you're, you're being perfect Sorry. so far as good as i can 
Um, yeah, okay, so yeah, so Sanakshi says, what subjects um, would you recommend to focus on in high school if you want to pursue a career in astronomy? So um, there are, so the, the obvious questions are physics and mathematics and also kind of computer science, like coding type stuff, uh, because first and foremost, astronomy is a branch of physics, right? So at least here in the UK, I'm not sure how it works in India, I think it's the same. Um, you can't go to university just to study astronomy. You have to study physics and then you do a bit of astronomy on the side. So my university degree was physics and then I had a specialization in astronomy. And it's only once I left to do my PhD that I was able to do astronomy full time. So physics is important. Maths is also really important uh, because mathematics is the language of the universe. If we're going to describe you know, anything from how fast planets are orbiting stars to when the Big Bang happened, we have to use maths. So physics and maths are important. Computer science is important because you have to do coding. Um, although I, th I think a really unconventional, those are the answers that everyone will give you, right? Kind of physics, maths, and computer science. I think my kind of weird answer, maybe just to surprise you, is that I, I also think it's maybe important to, to kind of like literature and uh, like kind of reading and stuff, because fundamental to doing science is being able to talk about your ideas and communicate your ideas. You can be the most brilliant scientist in the whole world if you don't know how to kind of express your ideas. And if you don't know how to kind of tell a story about your science, no one's going to listen to you. Um, so, you know, as, as well as the obvious answers of like physics and maths, I think it's also important to kind of keep, you know, keep in touch with the arts and learn how to kind of express yourself and learn how to, how to, about, to talk about your subject. Because all like the, you know, the absolute best scientists in the world is the one that can kind of talk about their science. And so I think it's it's really important to nurture that side of your brain as well. Um, can you become an astronaut uh, with an astronomy astrophysics field? Uh, you absolutely can. There have been scientists that go into space. I, um, I will say it's not the conventional way of becoming an astronaut. Um, most astronauts uh, work for the military. I think uh, historically they, they tend to be kind of like military pilots and stuff. Or, you know, these, <laughs> these days the way to become an astronaut is to be a billionaire and buy your way into space. Um, but it is definitely possible. So there's a, uh, there are people I know in astronomy who have applied to astronaut training programs. Um, so it absolutely is possible. It's not the most conventional way of doing it. But then again, being an astronaut is not the most conventional job. So yeah, who knows if you want to be kind of a general space expert, then sure, that would be the way. So on that note, Ashna is asking how much do astronomers generally get paid? <laughs> um, it's a... Uh... I'm not going to lie to you. You're never going to become rich being a scientist um, because if you, uh, yeah, if, if you learn all these things that you learn in, in you know, university, so, you know, to, to, to become an astronomer, you have to have a degree in physics and a PhD in astrophysics, which means a lot of learning about computer science and mathematics and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be totally honest with you. If you want, if you took all those skills and quit to work in finance, you would get paid a lot more. Um, but, um, you, you know, but you, you know, you, you get to learn about the universe. you like, you, you won't, you won't be poor. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, so I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna tell you my salary cause that's a bit weird, but you know, I, I get paid, I get paid more than a high school teacher, but like, I don't, I don't own a Ferrari, you know, maybe that's a kind of a good way of putting it. You, you're, ne you're, you're, ne you're never going to be rich, but it is definitely one of the most fascinating and rewarding jobs I can even imagine. So I think we have our last question from Koshiki, which is, what if the universe wasn't flat? How would it change this field? Oh, that's a really good question. So I think before I even answer that, it's, I think it needs, it's worth, answer, worth describing what we even mean when we say a flat universe, because it doesn't, when we talk about a piece of paper being flat, you know, it means you can only walk around it in two dimensions. And our universe is obviously not flat, right? We have three dimensions of space and a dimension of time, right? So we have this four dimensional universe, which is very much not flat. What we mean when we talk about flat universes is kind of, is there an overall kind of bend curve to the universe? And uh, so I think, yeah, forgive, forgive, forgive the background. I think we need to talk about background before I answer the question. Um, so if you draw a triangle on a piece of paper, um, the angles in the triangle will add up to 180 degrees, right? That's kind of high school geometry. And so that's a flat universe is where all triangles add up to 180 degrees. If, if a universe is not flat, then that's not true. 
So for example, imagine the Earth. Imagine you start at the North Pole and draw a line down to the equator. Okay, so you've got the North Pole down to the equator. And then at 90 degrees from that first line, you draw another line down to the equator from the North Pole. Both those lines would meet the equator at 90 degrees, right? So we've got a triangle, like kind of line down to the equator, round the equator, and then back up to the North Pole. That's a triangle where all three angles are 90 degrees. So we've made a triangle that adds up to 270 degrees. Um, which is crazy, but that, that works because the surface we're drawing it on is not flat. And so a big question for our universe is, is our universe flat? Like, and all the angles add up to 270, no, 180 degrees, or is the universe not flat and the geometry is a bit weird? And that's really important because if our universe is not flat, it means it might one day kind of collapse back on itself and be destroyed. So yeah, even though it sounds really boring and it's all about measuring triangles, um, the answer tells you whether the universe will be destroyed one day or not. Um, it turns out that as far as we can tell, to the limits of our measurement, our universe is almost perfectly flat, um, which is good news, which means the universe is probably not doomed. Awesome. I, I think that's that's pretty much it. Um, I think Sanash has one last, what is the concept of Tesseract? Um, yeah, so a, a Tesseract. Uh, so, so, okay, well, there's the Tesseract in mathematics, then there's the Tesseract in like Marvel movies. Um, so in movies, Tesseract normally means like kind of cool space magic thing. <laughs> um, in uh, in maths, if I'm remembering this right, a Tesseract is a high dimensional cube. So in the same way that a square is like a, a shape on a piece of paper. And then if you turn a square into a 3D shape, it becomes a cube, right? So a square is a two is the version in two dimensions. A cube is the version of th in three dimensions. A Tesseract is taking that one step further and making a cube in four dimensions. And um, so, yeah, so square to cube to tesseract is two to three to four dimensions. Uh, so it's a kind of a weird mathematical thing. I think I think at that point, um, we'll, we'll uh, you know, close it off today. Um, thank you, everyone, um, all, all the students out there for all the wonderful questions. I think you kept Matt really, really busy um, after the talk and thank you. Um, Matt, once again, for, for speaking to the students, I, I'm, I'm sure they really enjoyed it. Um, as someone who's like, you know, I took one astronomy class at Cornell, uh, which was fun, but um, I think I learned a lot more in one hour today. Uh, maybe I didn't focus too much, uh, you know, during my university days, but <laughs> it was it was really amazing. Uh, thank you so much. I think this was uh, the way the entire presentation was formatting, it, it, even people who are not that were not that interested are actually going to get get into astronomy. And I really hope that more and more people get inspired uh, by today's webinar. If you have a few more questions or anything else, please feel free to email it to me, and I'll make sure maybe I, I summarize it and send it to Matt. Um, you know, with more sort of research opportunities or some things that you can probably do as a high schooler, which are some of the questions probably that we didn't touch upon today. Um, also, we have recorded today's lecture, so we will make sure that we sort of send it out to all of you guys, um, if you know, if you just want to make notes or sort of want to go back to it. So on that note, thank you, Matt, once again, from the Big Red Group uh, to come here to speak with us. Any final parting words for our, you know, all our astronomy enthusiasts? Um, um, over to you. Um, yeah, mate, just just thank you, thank you so much for coming. I I wish you all the best in your in your careers, wh whether you are wanting to be astronomers or not. Um, just yeah, just all the best. Um, I think it's true. Almost every almost every career, the most important thing you can have is curiosity, and you know that's what astronomy has curiosity in spades. But so do lots of other careers. So just yeah, just all, all all the best with your the rest of high school and university and all the rest of it. Thank you, and we have got a lot of thank yous coming in, Matt, in the chat box. Um, so once again, uh, thank you from, from all the students out here. It really was a truly amazing session and we really hope to see you soon. Awesome. Cheers. See you guys. See you. See you. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Have a good day and have a great day.